So good morning to those joining us uh, this morning. Welcome to the first round table of the second morning of the conference calling the shots uh, sports and the European green evolution. We just had a fantastic opening speech from Maël Besson who is the head of sports at uh, World what fund France. We will, not, we will now talk about the commitments of the stakeholders to reduce the carbon impact. Uh, just a quick reminder is that, uh, a reminder that you have a Q&A uh, section. I don't know if it's uh, below the video on the right, on the left, depending on the way you use Zoom. So please ask your questions there so that we can answer, answer them. Uh, if you ask them directly to one of the panelists, he may and he or she may answer um, herself, himself. If not, we're going to try and answer at the end of the, of the round table. Um, just to remind you that we have a graphic facilitator, Mara, she's going to be drawing everything we said, almost everything we said. Uh, you have two channels, one in French, one in English, and you also have, and that's for everybody, the translation in the sign language. So let's begin with this first round table of the day. Once again, we, we talk about the, the involvement of the sports stakeholders in the reduction of carbon impact. Let me introduce you to our panelists. Christopher Marshall, he works for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as a consultant on the engagement sector. Uh, Gert Hendricks is the founding director of Sport and Sustainability International. Stefan Wagner is the founder and board member at Sports for Future. And Benjamin Levesque is manager impact climate and environment for Paris 2024. Good morning to all of you. Um, if I may ask to present yourself quickly in a, in a few words, maybe Christopher, if we can begin with you. Yeah, thanks, Anne, and thanks first off to the Surfrider Foundation Europe for the invitation to join everyone this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Marshall. I work for UN Climate Change on our sectoral engagement team. So that includes our Sports for Climate Action framework, which is an industry-wide coalition to drive climate action across sports. Gert? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, Rit Hendricks, uh, based in Lausanne. Um, I work uh, as a volunteer for Sports Sustainability International. So it's an NGO we created a few years ago, which has members uh, across the globe in 40 plus different countries, ranging from the big leagues and the federations to some of the very small organizations that, uh, that we like to engage as well. Uh, and in parallel, um, I do work um, as a consultant with a variety of sport organizations, uh, including uh, uh, Paris. So that's how I met Benjamin before. So uh, very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation to write us. Thanks for being with us, Hert. Uh, Stefan? Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation. My name is Stefan. I used to work for sports uh, in sports for a long time, uh, cycling, football, and now I have my own uh, office for sustainability and strategy. And so in this context, I work for different players in the Bundesliga, for example, and others in the climate context. And we try to bring um, sport in Germany on the on the playing field for uh, to tackle the climate crisis. And so we founded Sports for Future. Thanks. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Je vois que je suis le bon élève avec le fond d'écran euh, que, que vous avez proposé derrière moi. Euh, je vais faire en, en français, si c'est OK pour les panélistes, puisque Maëlle m'a fait penser en français jusqu'à maintenant. Donc, euh, je suis Benjamin Lévesque, je travaille pour Paris 2024 euh, en tant que manager impact climat environnement. Donc, euh, mon, mon job euh, est d'évaluer euh, les impacts de ce, de ce petit événement <rire> euh, sur le sujet de biodiversité et euh, de réduire euh, au maximum euh, ces impacts. Thanks to to all of you. So maybe we can uh, begin by designing the situation, explaining what the situation is and which factors contribute to the carbon footprint of sport practices and sports major events. I don't know who wants to begin with the with giving you giving us uh, an idea of the situation yeah i'm, okay, I'm so happy to i'm happy to get okay, going thank if, you. if no one else <laughs> yeah 
Uh, and, and perhaps I'll just start off with some high level context, uh, which is to say that climate change is the most important long term challenge uh, we face today as civilization. Uh, and we know that because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which many of you probably know about, released a report several years ago that said, if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to hold global average temperature rise to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. And by 2050, we need to, to reach net zero emissions. Uh, and so this is going to require really rapid transformations across sectors and society and, and drastic action. Um, so for the UN, you know, it was this idea of collective action that gave birth to our, our UN Sports for Climate Action Framework, which started a few years ago and has grown to over 230 signatories globally. Um, about 60% of these are in Europe. Uh, and the original idea was to give a platform to sports organizations to commit to working together on low carbon solutions and learn from each other on how to achieve climate neutrality uh, and lower their footprints. Uh, but on top of this, it was the understanding that, you know, sports really uh, have the power to, to, to unite fans and create this broader momentum in society in support of, of climate action. Um, and so now we see a situation currently where a lot more sports organizations are looking to get involved in this global climate movement, um, but simply signing a pledge or, or making a promise are no longer enough. Um, we need to move beyond just these, these commitments and introduce real emission reduction targets um, and, and required measurements and uh, public reporting and transparency. Um, so with this kind of more action oriented approach uh, for, for industry wide uh, action, we see sports wanting to align with 1.5 degree scenarios um, and, and drawing up plans is critical to that. So how do you avoid emissions? How do you reduce emissions? And for those unavoidable uh, parts of your emissions chain, you know, how do you offset those and compensate them in the near term before you look to go net zero long term? Uh, because frankly speaking, you know, a climate safe future doesn't depend on sports, but sports do depend on a climate safe future. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hecht, if you want to add something. Yeah, probably, I would probably say that, um, we're talking here about stakeholder involvement, and that's exactly where currently the biggest challenge, I think, is. Uh, because if we want to get to the goals that we all know, it's going to hurt a little bit. Uh, we, we can't just like try to do a few things and, and improve our way of walking, reduce. Um, I mean, I think you need to go beyond being neutral. You need to kind of think towards being regenerative, trying to somehow restore some of the things. But I think somehow we need to crack some of the hard nuts. And um, I give you an example of, of um, and, and that, that, I think that's where sport can play a good role. I think I give you an example from, uh, from, from Sensi, from Sports Sustainability International. We've been working on a pro program called Football for Climates and um, play, work with some of the top players um, who live this daily. And they are in an environment which is highly carbon intensive um, and for example Morten Toxby one of our uh, ambassadors from Sampdoria he was flying with the uh, Norwegian team he's Norwegian for a small kind of intercontinental flight everyone going on business class he himself stood up walked to economy class and said like I can do a two-hour flight in economy class because of the impact that it has to try to kind of to fly economy class instead of business class so those are the sort of, I would almost say micro things and the people that can be exemplary to really change some of the things. Someone like him can walk up to a sponsor who might be kind of playing a big role in it. If I always see that when I start talking about sponsors and their impact on this whole discussion, it's immediately like, don't touch the sponsors. Mm -hmm. So I think, but, but somehow you need to involve them in the discussion, otherwise you're not gonna get anywhere. So you need to play the right play and involve people who are willing to stand up, uh, whether it's athletes or, or fans, uh, to, to somehow address these big things. 
Um, and the second thing, and it was already mentioned during the chat of, uh, of uh, Amael, um, is the digital side of things. Do you guys know how much the carbon impact is of this Zoom conference? We think we're carbon neutral because we're doing things uh, virtually because we're not flying, etc. But if we want to at least reduce it, we should all switch off our cameras. Uh, seriously, there's little things in our digital footprint that I think are now coming to us. And because we have, I don't know how many Zoom calls per day, um, it starts to become big. And I read recently that um, the, the, the overall footprint per year of the online streaming, video streaming that we're doing is about the footprint of Spain, 300 million tons. So I don't know, Benjamin, that's like 100 times the estimate of, of the Paris Olympics. So the whole digital side of things is, is what we think like, this is fine because we're not traveling, we're not polluting, et cetera, but that becomes huge. And with all the sports going now, virtual as well. I think that's sort of the things that um, are often underestimated. So that's just my two cents. I think it's like somehow having these tough discussions and playing it well with, I don't know, with, with, with fans, with athletes, whomever is positioned best. And secondly, don't, uh, don't, don't longer ignore the carbon side of things because the digital footprint is just like exploding uh, here. Yeah, well, you you make me feel bad. I'm about to switch off the camera. <laughs> um, Stefan, uh, it's very interesting to what we've what we've just heard about the idea that we need drastic actions. Yes, um, I would like to give you an example for for my experience with climate topic. Uh, I used to work for the um, Bundesliga club HSV in Hamburg um, in, in, since 2000 and. Eight, we made a climate game in 2009, um, address the climate crisis at our Bundesliga game on, on, on the whole, in the whole stadium. Um, but nobody was interested in it at all. The fa not the fans, not the media, not the NGO, there was no one. Uh, and afterwards I went to the board members, um, said, we have to continue that. And they said, why? Nobody's interested in it. And this has completely changed. Um, I think the, uh, the attitude and the pressure from, from other stakeholders, from friends, from media, from NGOs towards the sport has grown massively, but there's still enough of some people who say, well, I'm a football club. What do I have to do with the climate crisis? Uh, and so they, if, if there comes pressure, they, they answer the question just from the, or they, they, they um, look at it in a defensive way, in a reactive way which means they only want to do as much as, uh, as possible, uh, as necessary to prevent cr criticism. But we have to turn the question around. Uh, we have to ask, what can we do to solve this massive problem we have all together? And what can sport to, uh, do to, to, uh, to play a really relevant role? And, and the good news is, um, and I'm, uh, I'm interested in if you share this impression, but in the last few months, especially in the, during the Corona crisis, um, I've seen much movement around the sustainability context, much more players, athletes, um, associations um, try to be much more engaged and take it seriously. And so they, they turn the question around and, and play a really relevant role because um, beside uh, reducing their own the, their own carbon footprint, sport can engage so many people around it, uh, around the sport, and and this is something not many others, uh, not many other um, branches or, or um, uh, uh, industries can do it like sports can do, and this is a huge responsibility. And yeah, I'm quite optimistic that it changes to real uh, enthusiastic. Um, action against the climate crisis. Benjamin, it's actually a huge responsibility for Paris 2024. Yes, it is maybe just a quick comment on the, the, the IT uh, carbon impact. Um, uh, so our, our overall, overall footprint is 1.5 million tons of CO2. And the IT part would, will be around um, around 5% of it. So 
75,000 uh, ton of CO2, and it's um, it's uh, because of the equipment, uh, because of the around uh, 200 applications that will be uh, uh, developed for the for the uh, for the Olympic Games, uh, because of the of the PC that uh, we are using, uh, that each uh, each worker at, at Paris 2024 is uh, is using. So so it's um, yeah it's a significant part. For your example, Gert, on, the, on this conference, uh, yeah, the, the, the impact uh, of, uh, of it being virtual might be around uh, 100 kilograms, maybe. Uh, if, 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 we, if, if we would have uh, moved, uh, it would be around uh, tons. Uh, so, so, so it's uh, less impact, but of course it's a concern because it will explode. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so and, and it's a, a hidden kind of hidden impact. So it's not just the electricity uh, at our uh, home; it's also the, the data centers, etc. So, so it's a concern, but it's uh, still we are uh, uh, avoiding uh, some CO2 emissions uh, having this conference uh, virtually. Uh, so that was a comment on, on, on the IT side. Maybe just um, a few words on the Paris 2024 uh, overall approach, if it's okay for you. Uh, um, we, um, we made a, a commitment uh, to have a positive contribution on climate uh, in, in March. Uh, and um, uh, it's uh, very important to, 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 to define <laughs> what is this, this uh, positive uh, contribution on climate because the definition do not really exist. And uh, I mentioned the, the uh, paper note from the ADEM, Different Agency for Environment on Carbon Neutrality, which is a very interesting uh, paper, which says that you have to be precise when you talk about neutrality or positive contribution. And our methodology is uh, anticipate, avoid, reduce, compensate, and mobilize. Mobilize. Uh, it's dis described on our, uh, on our web website. A lot of uh, information are going to, to, to come in the coming months and years. But um, uh, yes, so that is our, our methodology. And uh, uh, the, 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 the first thing is to, uh, to get into the numbers, because if you talk about uh, uh, carbon impact, you have to, 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 to talk about a ton of CO2. And that's what we do uh, within uh, the organization committee, uh, having the ton of CO2 to, to as a, a key uh, uh, parameter uh, among the others, of course. Uh, there are also still some uh, uh, concerns about the, 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 the economic parts, uh, but some uh, many, many, many technical aspects, but it's one, uh, one uh, structurant and one uh, key uh, indica indicator for the, for the organization committee. And as Mile uh, uh, said, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a key parameter that was um, uh, evolved at the beginning. So we have a carbon budget, this is 1.5 million tons of CO2 that we don't want uh, to. Uh, to overhead uh, and uh, that drive uh, a lot of our activities uh, regarding the, the delivery of the Olympic Games. Um, to, to move on, do you think it's possible to, to imagine a carbon-free practice of sports? I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I had the microphone, sorry, so I, I, I can start with that. I don't know if, if that's okay for you. Yeah, uh, the, 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 um, the simple, um, the simple uh, answer is, is no, because uh, it's, uh, there is nothing is carbon free. Uh, so if you go uh, uh, running outside and uh, if you if you just if you if you did not uh, buy new uh, shoes, uh, maybe if you do not take. Uh, uh, if you do not take a shower, uh, if you do Is not eat uh, animal proteins uh, because you run, uh, you might be very, very uh, low carbon, but you, you won't be uh, uh, carbon free. But, but you can be uh, low carbon, of course, in your, uh, in your uh, practices and um, you can contribute to climate change uh, financing uh, projects that, that will store some tons of, of CO2. But, uh, uh, carbon-free sport uh, practice, it, it, uh, it does not uh, exist. If, I, I don't know if 
uh, Chris, you want to answer some, uh, add something to the, the this idea of yeah. carbon free? Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, yeah, I would agree with Benjamin, you know, in the short term, probably no. Uh, carbon is embedded in basically everything we do and consume. Uh, and, and fully decarbonizing sectors uh, like sports relies on additional decarbonization of sectors where there are serious technology or market barriers to doing so and going carbon free. But I think maybe an important question to, to reframe the question, an important way to look at it is how do we imagine a carbon free sport practice? Because that's no, that's, we know that's where we need to go. Um, and so in the near term, there are options available to organizations uh, to avoid and reduce the emissions that are under their control. Um, they have influence over their energy usage, uh, how employees and sometimes athletes uh, travel or how fans travel, um, how, how volunteers travel. They can influence those things um, often, not always. Um, how venues are using cooling and heating and, and ventilation and and waste management and recycling and reuse practices. These are all things that can be done uh, oftentimes in the near term um, and, and how you are engaging vendors, suppliers uh, and, and purchasing requirements that align with low carbon priorities um, and, and moving away from what's under the direct control of an organization. There's eventually gonna be a point where some emissions are unavoidable. Um, and, and this is kind of, for the UN, what the Sports for Climate Action Framework's new development is trying to tackle uh, by requiring that in the near term, the avoidance and reduction of emissions is the priority um, and that there needs to be some compensation mechanism to get us to a, a net zero framework uh, in the future when it is possible to, to control some of those other uh, emissions that are deep in the value chain, so to speak. Uh, how can we how can we promote uh, this environmental awareness among the the public the the sports persons i i'm not thinking only about the athletes but everybody you were talking about people going to have a run on sunday morning i mean it's not carbon free obviously but how how can we promote this awareness among the public We try to, um, with Spots of Future, we, we make a really low threshold approach uh, with the, for, for a campaign, which we call Spots for Trees. I know we are talking about off, off, offsetting in the best case, um, but we try to use platforms we all have in, in sports to, to engage people and to raise awareness for sports. And it, it can be re really easy. So if you buy a ticket, you can add one euro or, or five euros to, to buy or to uh, the tree sampling. It won't solve the climate crisis, but it raises awareness and it shows um, that it's um, that it's in the responsibility of everyone, and we now have a few hundred supporters um, around Spots for Future, representing more than 22 million uh, sports people, and we now um, just launched a rowing forest, a badminton forest, a hockey forest. We have uh, Bundesliga clubs who, who try to uh, to promote a climate ticket, like CSG Hoffenheim. Um, other clubs, Mainz 05 is carbon free since. It, well, uh, the carbon neutral since a couple of years and um, beyond their own impact, yet they can raise awareness. And that's so important that what sport can um, do right now. Uh, and it's very easy to do it right now. And this is where we can start, where we all can start. And I think that's the most important step sport can do at the moment. Yeah, just adding two things. One is, um, meeting recently with a, a company who's creating a digital wallet uh, using blockchain to basically promote environmental positive behavior so that people really get something back for the fact that they come by public transport to a sport event instead of taking their car or they make a certain choices. Um, so I think you give a certain value to the fact that they behave in an environmental uh, yeah, sensitive ways. I think that's a way to, to for example, engage fans a bit more. Um, another thing which also comes back, I think, to what uh, 
what Benjamin and Christophe said uh, just before is um, by working towards probably not a carbon free sport, but what kind of reduced carbon. I think if we start introducing carbon budgets, like some sport events start to do now, carbon is like money. You have a limited amount and like every sport event, they have a financial budget and you all have experienced that's going to be managed and you have to justify why you spent this much uh, and you have to think about it in advance and then you agree on it and you have to negotiate and you have to stick to it and you have to report on it the same principle common is also something that should be managed in a way like in my opinion like finances financial resources so that starts with measuring which i think the UNFCCC is doing great of now and really pushing that we start measuring because honestly i think the sports sector is still behind in in some ways that they don't necessarily measure for different reasons so they don't know if their carbon is 100 or 50 or 200 so if you do that first if you know it's 100 okay fine it's 100 then your budget for next year is going to be 80 for example and then you can start working towards that and you can start also kind of objectively making progress and I think including it in, in the management objective that you say, okay, this is just like we need to manage our finances as an event, we need to manage our carbon budget almost in the same, um, in the same way. So I think those are some of the ways to, uh, to get this better embedded into a sport event and avoid what I still see happening quite often is that the, the, the carbon expert is someone who's sitting in a corner who needs to work out something that we can report on to stay out of trouble, as, as I think Stefan, you said it, like some clubs wanted to stay out of trouble. I think if you bring this person in into the reporting mechanism and you make it an integral part of how you manage a sport event, you're taking a completely different approach. And I think for me, that's a key change in, in, in mindset that is happening in some events, but which I think uh, we should, we should have uh, go much further than it is right now. And you have to bring it together with financial incentives, like the part of the, the, like a revenues from media rights or uh, public funding or um, something else. So that's uh, that you said uh, CO2 uh, carbon footprint is like like my money, like a financial budget. And so you just bring it together and then uh, everybody has to deal with it. And just sorry, just on, the, on that note, it doesn't have to be financial towards fans, for example, because that's always difficult. I think something that we saw with Football for Climate that we're looking into, if, if you are the most environmentally kind of, the, the, the one with the most points in your environmental behavior as a fan, you can have um, non-financial incentives, like you get a little, little mention on the club's social media, or they share um, the playlist of one of the famous football players with you. Uh, you get a little like or your favorite football player gives you a shout out. Those are things that technically don't cost uh, money, hard, hard euros or something like that, but you can still do them. And, and I think for a lot of the fans, that is something that they would be quite keen in, keen on in, instead of having $10 or, or something like that, because then of course you get into a whole, you, you tap into another discussion of like how much money can we put in that sort of, uh, sort of things. Um, that, that leads us to the question of the policies, the actual policies that can be implemented. I mean, we were talking about drastic actions. I mean, drastic actions might need to come from policies. Policies are good, but they're not going to solve the problem. Um, <laughs> if, if, no, if you, if you have a policy, or um, even with your suppliers, but you don't have the controlling mechanism, for example, that they need to report on it and it is part of your integral reporting, how are you going to manage that? You can just tell them like, well, we have a policy, can you please stick to the policy? So I think it, it's, it's important to have a policy, but it's just like policies and pledges and, and, and those things, uh, they, they on itself are, are, are not the solution, so. So Sorry, that's probably too Dutch. <laughs> no, no. This, this, so the solution is is a financial solution, 
or is it the, the awareness of the public? So where do we begin? I don't know who wants to answer that. <laughs> I, think it's both. I think it's both. I think you have to have the financial uh, impacts. Um, just as I said, that, that um, public funding has to be combined with uh, sustainability items. And uh, when, you, when you have as a league a media budget, which you um, bring to the clubs um, as their fair share, then sustainability has to play a role. And uh, I think the awareness of, uh, of the other stakeholders uh, and, and what they expect from you are, are on the other hand side. And both together will bring us to re-election, I think, I hope. Uh, before we move to the Q&A session, if, if one of you wants to add something. Benjamin, I saw that you used the raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. No, no, no I, 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 in fact, I don't really know where, where you shall begin, but uh, obviously you have to, to evaluate and to anticipate your, uh, your, your impact. But what is uh, sure is that you, you must work on every aspect uh, and uh, get what you said is, is a good uh, synthesis of, of what we do, in fact, because on the carbon budget, we are working with the financial uh, department and the financial director and our carbon tool is uh, structured uh, as the, the, the finance tool uh, with the budget carbon that is uh, the target, uh, a carbon budget which is already consumed and a carbon budget which is engaged. Uh, so that that will, uh, will be the consequence of the decision we already make and that's exactly the same for finance. Uh, and, and so we are really embed embedded in the uh, uh, decision and the at the heart of the uh, organization. Uh, just on, on the awareness, one last word. Uh, we also are working at the individual uh, scale. So that's what uh, the carbon budget is clearly at the organization scale, at the inv individual scale. We just launched a, a tool which is called the Climate Coach. Uh, and uh, we shared it uh, at, at this step only with our 400 co workers. Uh, but uh, they, they, on a voluntary basis, they can evaluate their uh, personal and professional uh, impact. And, uh, uh, and it's a shame uh, we can't work. use it. Maybe, yeah, maybe we'll, uh, <laughs> we will. We, 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 of course, we want to, to share it uh, in the, the, yeah, the coming months or years. Uh, and of course, with the, having in mind the athletes, the spectators, and uh, every organization connected with the, with the Olympic Games. And the, this individual scale is a. Uh, it's really important because you realize your impact. I was saying there is no carbon-free activities, but it's of course not a reason not not to act. You have to to reduce it. And understanding your own impact, you you will take the 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 the, the right decision. And yeah, maybe like point on the on the policies and uh, and pledges and the tools. Uh, there is also a key. A key aspect Gert mentioned on the reporting and on the one report where we are at Paris 2024, we're working on the one report which embed the social and environmental impacts. And we have a procurement strategy that was designed with the procurement team and the procurement director, which does not lead to a few sustainable products we are going to buy, but it's uh, with some criteria embedded in the, in the, the, the procurement strategy of Paris 2024. Well, to, to go back to this app, I mean, it's it's exactly something we can, it's not a policy, it's something we could, we could use to, to raise awareness. I mean, I, I will give my example. If I had, I have an app to see what I eat, what I, if I'm walking enough, if I'm working out enough, I, I mean, that's for the public, that would be great. Maybe beginning with the athletes that they use this app to show how, how, we can manage and we can tackle to this this climate change and our footprint i mean if i have an idea that i'm using that much uh, maybe in the morning i will think okay today i have to make an effort i love this the, the idea of this app of this app we will move after this comment this very personal comment we will move to the q a session jan 
qu questions from the public. Yes, questions from the public. Uh, so so I, I've seen that there is a question from Papu, but uh, I think maybe Stefan can can answer it uh, later because it, I mean it's related to education, and I know that you have a, a lot of experience and background with this. But the, the question that I chose uh, was from Arnaud Repelin, and the question is, uh, what is the the power of um, uh, international federation? um to reduce the carbon impact um for instance um do we have the right uh, to let um, a country build a football stadium uh, with aircon uh, in a desert country for instance <laughs> You want a politically correct answer? Or, uh... <laughs> I was, I, I, this, I, I was looking recorded, at right? you guys. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think we 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 between friends, so you, you, yeah, you can, exactly. you There's can no speak one on this you. call between us. Uh, no, no. Uh, let me just let me say one thing. I think there is the uh, the political side in sport events in, in federations, and there's the administrative side, and. There's so many moving parts in the political side where elections are being made, where uh, decisions on, on uh, hosting cities, et cetera, are made. And, and that side is often stands very much on itself. And it has, it has, right, it has the typical policies, it has guidelines, it has things, but it's, 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 a, it's a piece that is making the decision on we're going to host our sport event in Qatar, let's call it what it is. And then there's the administrative side who has the delivery event. And that's why you've got these amazing professionals who are faced with decisions that have been made. And, and they make the most out of that. And they have to deal with all these decisions that somehow have been made. So I think that because we, I mean, of course we can, we can slam sports for making certain choices, but I think it's important to recognize that you've got this political side and you can, that is the system that exists uh, so you can have a conversation about whether the system should be like that. And then you've got the administrative side, which most of us, I think, are, are, are more involved in where, OK, we're going to have a football tournament in a, in a country like Qatar. We're going to have this event there. Then somehow you have to deal with this. I think it's just fair to say that you have those two things that are, are probably not connected as they should. So there's definitely stuff that should be that should be considered. But it is the system uh, that that we function in, particularly within, I would say, the Olympic movement. That's how how we function. So uh, that that's just uh, what I would say as 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 one response. Then, of course, you can um, you can say like, okay, you put guidelines, etc. But then, if countries make choices themselves, to which extent can you, as an international federation, uh, regulate that? And, and but probably finally, let's my, my input on that is I unfortunately still see a lot of international federations that don't necessarily have the footprint of their event. So you're going to have a very difficult discussion with anyone who's going to challenge you on this if you don't know the numbers. So I think it comes back again to you need to do your bring your house in order as international federation and know your numbers. We accept for the time being probably that the system it is it is what it is. But again, if you, if you want to fight the battle and you don't have the numbers in place, uh, it's, it, you're, you're kind of starting the game with 2-0 behind. So, uh, well, I don't know if others want to chip in, but that's just my not so political response. Well, maybe a bit broader uh, approach, not about Qatar, but uh, what, what we see is that athletes themselves um, go to their associations and say, for example, from the hockey national team uh, in Germany, the athletes went to their um, association and said, so now we have a, a game in Australia, one game and go there. And afterwards we go to South America for not, not another game. And that's not, that can't be serious anymore. And they try to um, bring the association from their own perspective to, to change it. And um, we have um, some rowing uh, athletes who would go to the Olympics and they, um, they try to measure their footprint which they where they have to fly to Tokyo uh, when we're gonna have the Olympics, um, and they say, well, well, we can't we can't discuss it. It's bad, but we want to do something against it. And so when the grass is kind of grassroots awareness um, raises in that way, I think 
um, people and organizations will think about it twice. Um, before we close this round table, if one of you wants to add something, just a final word. Okay, so I think we are, we are done for this round table. It was actually very interesting and I'm sorry, Benjamin, but I really want this app because I want to see how bad um, how bad I am at um, trying to, to help the, the client. Great. I guess I'm not that bad because I use the train yeah, a lot. You will see, yeah, that will be your starting point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go cycling, I use my bicycle. No, I think I'm not that bad. Thank you so much anyway, thanks to you. Hopefully you, you'll be followed, um, your ideas will be followed in the future. If you guys can answer the questions that are in the Q&A session, if you have time for that, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, keep on sending messages, you you that who are watching us. We will, I'm <coughs> sorry, now move on to the second round table. We will talk about the outdoor sports facing the challenge of adaptation. Uh, and before we move to that conference, we will see Mara's drawing. Thanks to the panelists of this morning. Thank you so much. Hope to see you soon. Without a video, because the video is using too much carbon. I got that. See you in a bit.